we live in a world of unsustainability insofar as the past stable policy and conditions of the world are no longer accurate, reliable predictors of what's coming. And our policy, our politics and our thinking needs to be updated to understand this uh, new contextualization. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode two of the Ecopolitics podcast, season two, Global Ecopolitics. So this is a podcast for university students tackling some of the big questions in the field of global environmental politics. I'm Ryan katz from the University of Ottawa, and I'm co-host of the show along with Dr. Peter Andre from Carleton University. How's it going, Peter? Hi, Ryan. It's uh, great to be here today. I'm really looking forward to our conversation with uh, Haley and Simon. Well, so am I. And why don't I introduce them right now? Uh, we are both here with Dr. Haley Stevenson, Associate Professor in the Department of Political Science and International Relations at L'Universidad Torquato de Tela in Buenos Aires. And we're here with uh, Dr. Simon Dalby, who is a professor at the Balsillie School of International Affairs. Wilfrid Laurier University, and full disclosure, he was one of my co-supervisors from when I was a PhD student many moons ago. So uh, welcome to both of you. Hi, everyone. Great to be here. Hi, Ryan, Peter, Simon. Looking forward to talking. Hello, Haley. Hello, Ryan. Hello, Peter. Looking forward to this. Welcome to you both. Uh, in this second episode, we're continuing to set the stage for the big theme of global ecopolitics. In our last episode, Ryan and I briefly touched on some of the ways that this second season differs from the first, and we're enlisting both of you, uh, Haley and Simon, to help as experts in this field to help us introduce the study of global ecopolitics, or the field of global environmental politics, to our listeners. So I'm going to start with you, Haley, since uh, you recently wrote a textbook titled Global Environmental Politics, which both Ryan and I use in our classes, by the way. Uh, can you help us give some definition to this field of study by telling us how you see it? Is global ecopolitics a subdiscipline of international relations in political science, or is it um, a new interdisciplinary field? What features distinguish this field of study from other subdisciplines within political science or political studies, and what makes it unique for you? So thanks, Peter. It's a, it's, a, it's a great question on how to define the field of, uh, of global environmental politics. I think broadly, I would say that global environmental politics is, is the study of how social, economic and political processes that transcend the nation state provoke or exacerbate conditions of unsustainability, as well as, how the, as the study of how the international community grapples with, uh, with that unsustainability. And I think that's a, a broad definition because I think it's a really broad field um, of study. But um, I, I kind of use that definition of unsustainability, which I think is a, is a good way of capturing um, the, the, the nature of the problem that we're facing and how that they're all part of one condition of unsustainability. Um, there is a, you know, often a tendency in theses when students are, are coming to think about their theses that they, uh, they, they focus on one, one issue. And I think that it's, it's really important to understand um, issues in depth on their own, but also to realize how they are connected in kind of a broader uh, condition of unsustainability. Um, so I think the, the, the idea of global forces us to think about how um, many of the, the causes of discrete environmental problems uh, are common, how they have common and shared um, uh, causes, and how in many cases those causes uh, emerge from, uh, from, from processes beyond the nation state or beyond the local level, um, or causes that might seem local uh, also are, uh, you know, have been globalized so that they're common across, uh, across different uh, areas. One thing I would say, you know, in thinking about, well, how is global environmental politics different from international environmental politics or environmental politics? And I think sometimes it's, uh, it's a matter of kind of a trend. The term global environmental politics has become most common, most popular. And um, sometimes people use the term global instead of international deliberately because they want to uh, they want to highlight that they're thinking about actors and processes beyond interstate relations and interstate interactions. 
Um, sometimes they use the word transnational. I always start my course on global environmental politics, kind of clarifying what I mean by these terms, because often they are used interchangeably. I think transnational is used to, to, to capture the actors that are involved, involved in interactions across states, but not just including the state itself. So uh, the subnational, which is increasingly important, kind of in, in global governance, um, uh, city mayors, uh, local government, and of course, you know, private actors, transnational corporations, uh, non-governmental organizations. So the field of, of global environmental politics, I think, it captures or tries to think about and study how these different actors and processes at multiple, um, you know, and overlapping uh, levels uh, are interacting to produce conditions conditions of unsustainability and to, you know, try to grapple with that and try to, um, uh, you know, try to, to, to somewhat uh, ameliorate that. That, that condition or transform that, that condition of unsustainability. That's a really interesting answer uh, to the question, Haley, and I, I think very comprehensive. And I just want to pull out one piece of that. You referred quite a few times to the idea of the conditions of condition of unsustainability. And I wonder um, if this is one of the ways that global environmental politics maybe leaves political science behind a little bit because there's other forms of knowledges um, that we as students of environmental politics, global environmental politics, need to get our heads around in order to understand that condition of unsustainability and how to respond to it. Do you want to speak to that at all? Like, what are the, if, for students in environmental politics, what are some of the, the ways that they maybe need to think about their own education as they uh, target themselves towards working in this field? I think that's absolutely right. I mean, uh, I think you asked whether global environmental politics is a sub-discipline of international relations. And I think actually it's um, it's a very, global environmental politics is a very intellectually demanding field of, of study. I myself majored in international relations in my undergraduate, uh, in my undergraduate degree. And I think it, it gave me some tools to understand global environmental politics. Um, but I think, you know, I never actually studied environmental politics. This was back in the, I started in 2001. And in my, in my program, there was no mention of, there was no treatment at all of environmental politics. I think some of the broader, you know, issues about how, you know, the difficulty of, of cooperation among states, it helps us to understand some dimension, some of, some part of the problem of unsustainability at the international level. Uh, but, but it has it has great limits, and I found to to, to really understand um, the causes of these problems and different perspectives on the causes, and different uh, to also understand the different ways in which actors respond. I really had to read well beyond the discipline of international relations, uh, and so I find myself being you know reading in areas that I have no training in in economics, in ecological economics, in sociology, political economy some kind of public administration, uh, thinking about how decisions are made at different levels and, you know, problems in, in implementation, where international relations as, uh, as a discipline really ha doesn't really help with that. So I think it is um, an intellectually uh, demanding field of study. Uh, there are some things we can understand if we just use kind of frameworks from international relations. But I think all sorts of questions arise when you really are interested in this challenge of unsustainability. Questions arise that you want to you want to find the answers to, and international relations just doesn't uh, that, that doesn't help with that. So one example: international relations scholars often think about um, effectiveness in terms of well, was an agreement reached? Did states make an agreement, or and perhaps uh, was it implemented? So that's one way of thinking about effectiveness, and that's the way that international relations, the discipline kind of um, um, pushes us to understand it in that way. But if, for example, China has, as part of its pledge for the Paris Agreement, um, to reduce its energy intensity, well, we don't have the tools within international relations to know well, what are the problems uh, with an energy intensity target. Like we really need to know the the literature from ecological economics about decoupling, um, you know, and then we discover that well, the decoupling is really just a unicorn. And so it doesn't matter if the, it's, it's not effective if, if the pledges themselves are based on, um, on, on premises that are, are quite problematic in that have been shown to be problematic and weak 
um, in, in the economics and the ecological economics literature. So I think we really have to be willing to, uh, to, to look well beyond our own disciplinary uh, boundaries and not be too, not identify too strongly with just uh, what one discipline. Uh, let's get into uh, some of the substance then of global ecopolitics and this condition of unsustainability. And this is where I want to bring you in, Simon. Uh, I know that you've recently published a book uh, titled Anthropocene Geopolitics, Globalization, Security and Sustainability. Uh, first off, some of our students may not be, many will be, but may not be familiar with the term Anthropocene. So can you maybe define that and tell us how you understand uh, Anthropocene geopolitics in a nutshell? Thanks. Yes. Um, Anthropocene, the first thing to note about it is it's a geological term. It quite literally means in geological language, uh, the uh, era of global geological history driven by humans, the anthropos, that's us. Uh, as in anthropology, it means it means people um, in, in, in the vernacular. The point about it is that the earth system scientists are increasingly are using this term uh, because the previous geological period, the so-called Holocene, which was basically since the last uh, retreat of the glaciers at the, the last the end of the ice age, 10, 12,000 years ago, has been remarkably stable in Earth's history. Very, very unusual that it has been that stable. It's been the circumstances which have given rise um, uh, to human civilization, allowed us to become the dominant species in the planet. But in the process of becoming the dominant species in the planet, we are changing how so many uh, parts of the planetary system actually work. Um, only most obviously the increase in carbon dioxide uh, recently in the atmosphere, which is causing climate change and has us all very worried about the future. But also um, the extraordinary expansion of human cultivation has dramatically changed habitats, uh, reducing forests uh, when we uh, turn them into fields um, and dramatically reducing the biodiversity, the sheer number of species and the prevalence of interesting um, ecosystems in, uh, across the, the terrestrial uh, world, but also dramatically changing the oceans, of course, the um, uh, overfishing in many places, but also increasingly worrisome is both the heating of water in the oceans and, of course, the acidification, because oceans have been sopping up quite a bit of the surplus carbon dioxide we've put into the atmosphere. Uh, and so this is the new circumstances in which humanity is now living, and we are changing the world on, uh, on the scale of volcanoes and, and plate tectonics, the old geological mechanisms. And what we now need to understand is this, these are the circumstances we're living in, and th the scale is big enough to require us to use an appropriate language, and the Anthropocene being a geological term suggests both the scale of the contemporary changes and the many, many thousands of years, uh, maybe tens, maybe hundreds of thousands of years at least, uh, that the impact of human activity will be visible um, to uh, in the stratigraphic record. In other words, the rocks of the future of the planet uh, will uh, have this record if you imagine yourself as a, as a paleontologist um, uh, or a stratigrapher, two good geology terms, um, in a, you know, four, five, ten million years uh, down the, the, the line in planetary history, looking back saying, ah, yes, here's where this crazy species um, uh, went, 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 went nuts and started turning rocks back into air on, on a rate that, that is quite unknown in, in previous geological history. This is the period. Um, driven by that species and its technology um, called the Anthropocene. So that's the origins of the, of, of, of the term outside environment literature, but in the earth science um, literature, which points to the scale and the speed and the longevity of the impacts that human activity is going to have. Well, thank you, Simon, for so it's been really great to bring students up to speed on the term the Anthropocene. And how would you characterize, as you did in your recent book, the politics of the Anthropocene as it relates to globalization, security, and sustainability? Well, geopolitics is used uh, is in everyday language to refer to the rivalry of big states. More technically, it's really about the influence of particular powers and particular organizations over space and territory. 
But it's also crucial um, in terms of how foreign policy in particular is done, because geopolitics is about the most simple, obvious, taken for granted assumptions about how the world is organized politically. It provides the framing in political discourse, and that justifies uh, policies um, and practices of both domestic and international politics. Mostly, um, the assumption is that the map of the world is pretty much stable. Um, that the climate patterns of the past are a reasonable prediction of the future. We make foreign policy on the assumptions uh, that the, the past is a reasonable guide, at least of the range of phenomena in terms of climate, in terms of weather, in terms of, of, of geographies, of where shorelines are, those practical things, which species are likely to inhabit um, and what resources are available in particular places. Those are the sort of basic framing devices in international politics. But of course, the implication of the Anthropocene is that the past is an increasingly unlikely uh, um, to, to be replicated in the future. If we are serious about policy now, we need to understand that we live in a world which is much less stable than traditional geopolitics has assumed. We need to understand that weather patterns are shifting, particularly rainfall. Species are starting to increasingly move in response both to the disruptions of expanded agriculture and urbanization, um, and, but, but are also moving as a result of, of climate change. So we are in a much more dynamic and less predictable world and that all requires that we think about security, foreign policy, wherever we happen to be based, uh, in taking these new um, understandings of the Earth system uh, into account. So I'm going to jump in here, and, and that's a really great uh, foundation that both of you have offered um, for listeners in terms of defining this field. This is a broad field. This is an interdisciplinary field that incorporates elements from not just the political and the ecological uh, but other uh, uh, fields in the social sciences and hard sciences as well, uh, which is kind of remarkable. And, you know, we're transcending national borders um, because the environment doesn't, doesn't, uh, is not bound by, by national borders. And fundamentally, we're addressing um, issues of unsustainability, as both of you have pointed out. Uh, and, and that extends to uh, unsustainability at, in a, at a geological scale. Uh, which is which uh, another uh, is again a, a remarkable aspect of this field. Um, so we're really studying everything. But anyway, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn this back into a, a question for Haley. Um, is your your book is fairly recent? It was published in 2018, uh, and I'm kind of wondering when you reflect on the on the field uh, when you think about the next edition of the of the book. What do you think has changed in the field of global environmental politics, if anything? And of course, feel free to touch on this this awful uh, pandemic that is uh, plaguing us at the, the very moment we're recording for, for listeners who are wondering, we're recording, recording about a year in uh, to this pandemic. Um, but uh, but what do you think has changed and, and what might um, change in the book the, the next time it gets uh, published as a new edition? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I mean, um... In one sense, not much at all has changed. Like the existing trends are continuing without, you know, any real any real improvement. Um, but of course, the pandemic has uh, it, it is. Well, we're still waiting to see exactly what the impact will be on global environmental governance, in particular. Um, I think there are some different com conversations taking place. I think, especially at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, there was a sense in, there was a, a lot of this idea about the earth is returning to breathe and, um, you know, the wild animals are coming back and the humans are the virus. Um, perhaps that's a conversation for another time. I personally don't think that's a very helpful way of thinking about, um, about unsustainability. Um, but I think that there were conversations starting to take place about, well, yeah, this is, we really needed this to happen and we need to rethink how we live, how we work, how we move. Um, but there, of course, is a political inertia that takes place um, alongside that. So to give an example from where I live in Argentina, um, at the same time that we're all in lockdown, um, there was an agreement signed with, uh, with China to, for, for massive investment in industrial pig farms here in, in Argentina. And we know that those industrial pig farms are you know, a hotspot for new viruses. Um, we know that, that that's a potential source of, uh, of new pandemics. 
as well as a, as the environmental uh, impacts that go along with that that scale of, of agriculture. So we see kind of this, on the one hand, we do see some new conversations uh, taking place um, uh, you know, among citizens. And at, the, at, the other, at exactly the same time, we see just a kind of a continuation with, with, with the status quo without really um, a pause and a rethink of, um, a, you know, of what kind of development and foreign investment is, uh, is desirable from a, from a socioeconomic perspective as well as from a health uh, and environmental perspective perspective. So yeah, so I'm not really sure what the ultimate impact of the pandemic will uh, will be on environmental politics. There is a sense as well as having these conversations about we need to live differently, there's also kind of this impatience to get back to the way things were before. And so I think there are so many kind of conflicting uh, dynamics at play during dur- during the pandemic. Uh, we also know that there's a huge, you know, the waste, the, pa- the plastic waste problem, which after after many years of campaigning by some environmental groups, finally was defined as a problem that required kind of action. And that's obviously lost a lot of momentum now with all of the, uh, the disposables, all of the, uh, the, the, you know, the masks that we, that we need to use, uh, create new environmental uh, waste. So, yeah, there is some major challenges uh, ahead affected by the pandemic. And, yeah. I take that point of, of of it being a complex this issue with with COVID nineteen and the the influence that it has on on sustainability or 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 sustainability for that matter is a complex one. There are trends that are continuing. Uh, there are trends. There are new conversations, as I think one way you put it, and. Uh, I think that's a salient point. I completely agree on this point of uh, you know the the trope of Earth is healing. I think was a little bit uh, far fetched, um, but it was interesting to see that you know these these massive changes to our way of life did have a measurable uh, impact on at least you know air pollution, and, and also it did see a, a precipitous drop in in greenhouse gas emissions. Although, as you point out, you know these are starting to come back. Um, Ryan, if I could just add a point there. Um, I think it's a really problematic narrative about the earth healing and that, you know, that we are the virus. It it overlooks massive inequalities uh, and different ways in which the pandemic is burdening different people. But I think it's also potentially dangerous to give the impression that that this is the kind of approach that we need, like to, we need to to uh, to kind of just put everything on pause in order to, uh, to to respond to conditions of unsustainability. It needs to be much more deliberate. It needs to be much more planned and uh, and structured responses rather than just being kind of forced in, in into lockdown. Um, in many many places, lockdown is really politically unpopular, socially unpopular, and to have an association where you know we just need to stop doing everything in order to um, in order to respond to to environmental problems, I don't think is really helpful. Well, I agree. I agree uh, entirely. And um, at the risk of getting car- careening off the direction we were hoping to take this discussion, uh, yeah, you know, maybe we should think about this, Peter, because uh, there's there are so many lessons and 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 uh, questions to be asked about the relationship between COVID nineteen and the pandemic. I, I noticed a, um, a really interesting article talking about avoiding climate lockdowns and, you know, invoking this idea of, of lockdowns as, uh, as you know, these major restrictions and, and sort of coercive policies at the level of the state to, to stop people from doing everyday uh, activities and, and com- you know, just kind of invoking this idea of, of making sure that we come up with, with policies to address climate change so that we don't have to treat climate change mitigation the same way that we've kind of had to deal with uh, dealing with this virus. But I want to get back to to one other thing, because I know, you know, you came up with this example of, uh, you know, th- these investments in these industrial pig farms. And it reminded me of something that you've written a lot about recently in the context of global climate governance, which is uh, the lack of integrity. Um, so you foregrounded this idea, and you've you've called it out as bullshit. Uh, you call it bullshit in climate governance, and you've made a point of using that specific term. Um, what are some um, examples of bullshit in climate governance uh, that that uh, our listeners should be aware of, and why is it important to you to to use that term and to call it that? Yeah. So um, 
when I wrote the book, I wasn't actually thinking about, about bullshit. I was actually already starting to think about the, the topic, but it wasn't included in the book. But in the book, what I really wanted to show was this mismatch between, uh, between problems and policy and practice. So the, once problems are defined, um, the, the, the policies that are made are always kind of lacking and don't match up to the scale and the nature of the problem that's been identified. And then policies are often implemented incompletely or in contradictory ways, which means that the practices are even further uh, from the kind of actions that we need to respond to, to the problems. So that mismatch was a constant theme uh, in, in the book. And, and I just find the there's this idea that now that we're all environmentalists, so everybody talks about when we've got Shell talking about how uh, client they're responsible, uh, you know, in a positive way that they take the problem seriously. If we're all environmentalists, then it makes me wonder: well, what even is an environmentalist? What does that mean? And I just find a, I find that kind of personally infuriating the kind of the, the hypocrisy that we see around the rhetoric about taking the, 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 these problems seriously. And just the, the, the lack of um, action that really matches up with the rhetoric that's being used. And perhaps it sounds extreme, but I would, I would really say that I'd prefer to hear someone like Bolsonaro say that climate change is, is, is rubbish than, than have that kind of idea of Shell saying, you know, we take this problem seriously, we're committed to a carbon neutral future. Like to have the explicit denial, I think, is better than having this kind of um, this fake, uh, this fake sincerity. One question that I've been asked several times is, you know, where is bullshit not taking place? And you know, the answer that I've given is that I think Brazil and United, the United States under Trump, so Brazil under Bolsonaro, and uh, and the United States under the leadership of Trump, there has been less less bullshit because they're explicit about their their lack of interest and commitment to the problem. Um, but, but elsewhere, we just see that the action uh, does not pair up to, uh, to the words. When I say bullshit, I mean that there is a kind of a, an indifference to the truth, that there, it's not necessarily a lie, but it's, it's an incomplete, uh, it's, it's not completely true. So, for example, there's a lot of attention to whether a state adopts um, a carbon tax or an emissions trading scheme and what's going to be more efficient and, um, you know, when are they going to implement it. There has been vastly less attention to fossil fuel subsidies. And I just think, well, if a country is going to adopt a carbon tax and then maintain massive subsidies in fossil fuels, then it's just completely contradictory. And we need to be able to identify that contradiction and call it out and make kind of governments accountable for the contradictions in their policies, not just pushing them to introduce a carbon tax or introduce an emissions trading scheme without addressing the, the, the contradictions that also exist in policy. Well, that's a great and the most thorough definition of bullshit I've ever heard. <laughs> it's fantastic. Uh, Simon, what do you think when you, when you hear about this, uh, you know, this constant uh, theme of insincerity, mm-hmm. this indifference to the truth, which I think, uh, which I think we can all see plenty, plentiful examples of that in global environmental politics. What do you think uh, when you hear that? Clearly, there is an indifference to the truth. What is politically convenient is what politicians frequently say. Um, it gets depressing when the public relations folks for Shell companies or, or for Shell Corporation and all sorts of other similar companies, you know, follow along and, and, and express sincerity. But I think what is interesting uh, in the last couple of years uh, is that many of the, the larger uh, corporations have felt compelled by political pressure to start using that kind of language. Uh, it is beginning to show up with uh, people getting much more uh, conscious of fossil uh, fuel uh, emissions coming from corporate activity, the larger corporate social responsibility campaigns are beginning to mean that at least some corporations are starting to pay attention to it, to these things uh, because shareholders are increasingly beginning to put pressure through pension funds and, and, and so on. Uh, increasingly also the uh, financial institutions are starting to think about the, um, the, the climate risks of their investments. Uh, if they're investing in a company, they want full disclosure on the on the climate risks, and because well, actually, they're beginning to realise that we do live in an unsustainable world. Uh, we're beginning to understand that everything from uh, commodity chains to returns on particular um, you know fuel in type investments are are, are up for grabs now, um, and that is beginning to shift um, corporate behaviour. 
uh, in ways that that hopefully will move move in the right direction. Because it seems to me that the uh, you know the pandemic has actually heightened the the awareness of this vulnerabilities to unexpected hazards. Um, well, clearly all sorts of implications for business um, trying to respond to the to the pandemic. We're all um, not only aware of the you know plastics in 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 face masks and and the rest of the personal protective equipment that Heidi mentioned a few moments ago um, as an environmental problem, but we're also aware of it as as a vulnerability because at least failure to plan for um, adequate production and for uh, monitoring the you know the supply chains effectively and making sure they stayed intact um, we suddenly discovered all sorts of vulnerabilities there too and that i think has got attention not only from governments but from corporations um, so in terms of the unpredictability the need to think through how to live in a much more dynamic and less predictable world um, all of that is beginning to um, uh, add a little bit of substance under the insincerity because in fact it's materially affecting um, corporations in, in, in many places. Um, I think that you know one of the other things that to, to the point about the pig farms, I mean one of the fascinating um, little sidebars to the whole virus spread uh, agriculture thing has been the, the question of, the, of Denmark uh, where a virus morphed into a slightly new strain uh, in the mink farms um, in Denmark. Who knew there were 18 million mink in the north end of Denmark being um, farmed for, well, mink is, is all about fur and status consumption, isn't it? Um, they slaughtered 18 million um, mink in the attempt to uh, prevent that new strain of the virus reinfecting the, the human population. Um, our relationship with animals and our relationship with um, agriculture is highlighted here. We no longer live in a world of, of small family farms. We live in massive industrial um, uh, agricultural systems, not just for food, but as the mink em emphasis for status consumption as well. Um, we do need to shift the focus, um, not only from environmental protection, protect, protecting existing bits and pieces of nature, much of which really needs further emphasis, but we do need to shift the whole um, uh, conversation to what we are making from protection to production um, seems to me to be absolutely crucial. And in terms of uh, the implications of both climate change and the, the pandemic, uh, we need to think about uh, what kind of economy we build back better, as the phrasing um, has it these days. We have to think about uh, the future of the Earth. Is, are we making more plastics? Are we making more solar panels? Are we making more carbon dioxide? Are we making more um, windmills? What are we making? Um, because we are quite literally um, shaping the future, making the future. And the Anthropocene suggests that while environmental protection and trying to clean up the messes after we've done bad things um, is no longer an adequate uh, approach to these issues. We need to think much more explicitly about who decides what gets made. In other words, we need to think about uh, climate, we need to think about pandemics and the Anthropocene as a question of political economy. Who decides what kind of um, economy we have collectively going forward is now the big question highlighted by the intersection of climate uh, and pandemics. So Green New Deals and such things are raising this um, issue because it is all about how we retool our economy um, to make a much more sustainable future. And that seems to me to be what the pandemic and the climate change um, uh, intersection has, has now highlighted. Um, and some of it may indeed be um, just greenwashing or bullshit. Um, but I think that we are now at a moment when those bigger decisions about the future um, are being made. And let's hope that we do build back better with a lot less investments in pipelines and a lot more investment in sustainable modes of, of living for the future. So I, I think uh, I absolutely agree with, with Simon that we need to be thinking about, you know, producing differently. Um, these Green New Deals, I think we need to recognize um, that benefits in one country or improvements in one country can't be really understood just on their own. We need to be thinking at, at, at an international, at a global scale. Um, we know that many countries improve their their climate footprints or their ecological footprints because they change the nature of their economies. They become more service-based, less production-based. Um, so 
So I think that's a, that's kind of a, a, an example of bullshit that I do see as well when a country talks about the improvements that they've made in reducing their greenhouse gas emissions when their imports um, on fossil fuel intensive um, produced goods are continuing and we don't see a reduction in those imports, then we need to you know, recognize that that's part of their, their responsibility. And another part of that is kind of, um, of, uh, of thinking about who, um, who benefits and who loses when improvements are made. I mean, we know that much of the wealth in the global north has been accrued through the use of resources from, uh, from the global south. Um, often uh, with problems then kind of uh, returned to the global south in terms of toxic waste, um, et cetera. Um, There is also a question of many of the kind of precious metals that are used in the production of much of the green technology uh, comes from extraction in in places that does also have environmental um, uh, effects at the local level, often it has effects on workers and their health and their, their conditions. And I think... It's, we really need to be aware of those uh, of the how other people in distant places are affected by the, the decisions that we make to improve our own environmental uh, and, and social conditions uh, in, in our own countries. That connects up explicitly with the, with the theme of, of, of geopolitics, because one of the major concerns about dealing with climate change is what happens to states that rely on fossil fuel revenues um, heavily if they uh, suddenly discover that their fossil fuel demand, uh, their exports are going down because demand around the world is, is declining and they're not prepared to pivot to a new post fossil fuel economy, we may end up with you know further destabilization of, of political regimes, particularly in the Middle East. Is that actually what happened a few years ago when oil prices collapsed in Venezuela? Um, In other parts of the world, a failure to think about this new economy and plan for it um, may have all sorts of knock-on effects. And the fossil fuel dimension adds on to the points Haley was making about the geopolitics, because if we end up in a situation where the Paris Agreement uh, on climate change ends up tightening up the restrictions on uh, using fossil fuels and economies that are dependent on exporting because they're manufacturing economies will end up using more um, energy and hence being penalized by precisely the states that have exported their production capabilities to those states. Um, So the the rivalries among states and who decides how this gets, uh, gets resolved Um, brings us back directly to the questions of geopolitics. And if we get it wrong, are we in serious danger of of, of future conflict uh, about the responses to climate change? Um, All of these factors need to be considered in any um, course that's dealing with global environmental politics, or should that be with Anthropocene politics now rather than just environmental? This has uh, been a really interesting conversation, and we're down to our last uh, few minutes of the interview, um, in which I want to ask you both uh, to reflect a little bit on uh, what uh, what gives you a sense of hope going forward, given you know some of the rather uh, <clears throat> bleak trends that we've been discussing. I'm going to make this even more challenging for you, Simon. I'll start with you, because I know that you've written a lot about environmental security. And I wonder if you can, first off, just tell us a little bit about how you conceptualize that in the current geopolitical era, uh, and then ask you to also speak a bit of uh, whether you see any signs of hope, perhaps, in how uh, states and societies are uh, per- rethinking their their security and, and where that might take us in terms of addressing these conditions of unsustainability that Haley's been talking about. In in terms of security, um, the international dimensions of this are worrisome if we fail to plan. Um, One of the things that is interesting is militaries all over the world have been raising the alarm about climate disruptions, both because they will actually disrupt military activities, flooded bases and and hurricane damaged um, facilities and so on, but also recognizing that their dislocations and disruptions um, caused uh, caused by storms, caused by droughts, Um, are increasingly um, uh, disrupting societies in very many ways with spillover effects into into other countries. Um, So security is beginning slowly um, to link up 
questions of biodiversity and particularly with climate hazards. Um, it's early days yet in terms of whether that will actually push governments to much more explicitly um, uh, think about transitioning to more ecologically friendly modes of production rather than simply trying to manage the disruptions, which is, of course has been most of the focus. Looming over all this, of course, is the much larger question is of, of, of you know, with what kind of security would we have um, if failure to deal with climate disruption leads us um, down the road to, to major attempts to artificially modify climate, the whole so-called geoengineering debate. Um, and that's another looming issue in the long run for, for environmental politics. Because once you start getting into plans to artificially adjust to the climate, um, then who gets to decide you know, what climate um, is optimal for the future? Who gets to monitor and, 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 and uh, uh, you know, check that in fact states are doing what they claim they're doing. If um, one ends up with a situation with a major drought and one state government accuses another of causing the drought because of artificially modifying climate, we have got major environmental um, links here to the future security of an increasingly artificial world if that's the route we go down. Avoiding that route, of course, becomes a priority um, if you're serious about uh, security relating to a sustainable future uh, rather than where we just let fossil fuels rips and try to manage the manage the consequences. Um, we, of course, being rich um, uh, uh, states with large militaries, for people without the military option um, to deal with their security, like, for instance, the, 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 the populations of Tuvalu, um, Kiribati, uh, the Delta um, living populations in Vietnam and, 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 and Bangladesh, and so on, they don't have the military options. They simply have to take whatever those that are of us that are rich and powerful um, with fossil fuel economies um, dish out. Um, so thinking through all of those connections forces us to ask, well, environmental security for whom, where, um, as part of the larger discussion. And that question is also beginning to be raised rather forcefully um, in international um, uh, fora. Just listen to what the Secretary General of the United Nations had to say in his address on the state of the planet to Columbia University in December of 2020. And you get a sense about how those concerns are now also um, finding their way into international fora, even if the media, mostly in North America, doesn't seem to have paid much, much attention. So a uh, part of what gives you hope is really that these conversations, while they are in early days, and it takes, uh, you know, it's scholars like you, Simon and Haley, that are bringing it up for discussion from from the ground up. But but these dis these conversations are increasingly happening at the highest levels internationally. And um, there's, uh, you know, there's a lot of work ahead of us. Um, and, and I don't want to sugarcoat things as I turn to you, Haley. Um, you know, I'm not just looking to, to grab onto whatever, but I'm curious, what do you see that, that keeps you motivated and keeps you from throwing up your hands and just walking away from all of these questions? Yeah, it's a great question. And recognizing the picture that Simon just uh, set out, which is absolutely accurate, it's grim and it's really hard to be positive and optimistic and hopeful and perhaps that's a conversation for another time is you know how people activists and scholars these issues manage their emotions around these around around these issues um so i think on on the whole i'm not optimistic but um but there are you know there is a couple of things that on kind of different issues give me some little bits of hope. Uh, one is I think the, uh, the youth movement in the past few years, which has been, you know, had a massive impact, uh, kind of building on environmental movements uh, before them, uh, the, the uh, scientists or the, the, the scientific um, uh, activism and, and knowledge that the, this new youth movement has, has been able to uh, to, to really push forward and attract much greater attention than than had previously been the case, and I really noticed that here in in Argentina, where environmental attitudes are still you know really quite uh, really quite weak, and it's a, still a marginal issue. Uh, teaching, uh, I spent a few years where I didn't do any teaching; I was just researching, and I found getting back into teaching and working with uh, with, with, with young people is being much more hopeful. One thing I do think, connecting it back to the issue of bullshit, where I do see some hope from um, the, this kind of youth movement, is that there is just a much greater willingness to be direct. And you know, Greta Thunberg, who just calls it out, she really calls out 
uh, bullshit wherever she sees it. And I think that's the kind of uh, we really need that kind of activism that that helps people identify not just not not just the slogan of you know take action now, but but identifying the contradictions and the insincerity. Um, one thing that's when I published that article last year on on bullshit in global climate governance, um, so many practitioners that got in touch with me to say, gosh, I really see that taking place in my organization. And God, I'm so tired of hearing about that. Um, and I've started working recently with uh, Pablo Suarez in the Red Cross Center in the United States to think about bullshit risk reduction, to think about how we can um, minimize our willingness to accept bullshit. So how can we call it out knowing that uh, sometimes it's uh, it's uncomfortable to do so, sometimes it might um, uh, you know place our job in danger, dissent is often not welcome in organizations, but just hearing the number of people that got in touch to say, I really see that in my uh, in my organization, I'm sick of it. Um, that kind of gives me hope that at least that at least that tiny aspect of um, of unsustainability, the politics of unsustainability, um, you know, might make some might make some progress. Well, thank you very much for that, Haley, and thanks also to to Simon. But it has been quite a, re- a remarkable uh, whirlwind tour here. We started off defining the field of global environmental politics. Um, we turned into the, you know, the, this issue of, of dealing with unsustainability in a geological sense from, through a sort of political and interdisciplinary lens. We got into insincerity and bullshit and how that connects to unpredictability and in, uh, instability in, in terms of um, questions of environmental security. We related this to the COVID-19 pan- pandemic and realized we need to probably spend some more time thinking about uh, how the pandemic and, and efforts to manage it and even its uh, internal causes are deeply intertwined with the way that uh, environmental uh, politics uh, plays out. Um, so I think what I'll, what I should probably do, although I'd rather uh, keep talking about this all day is to just to, to start off by thanking you both um, for joining us for this episode um, and to promise you that we'll come back to this. So this is, uh, you know, these are difficult uh, topics. Um, they ask a lot of us emotionally and, and intellectually, but you guys have really uh, done a superb job in helping uh, our listeners and also our, our hosts uh, work through these issues. So thank you. Thank you guys very much for joining us. No, my pleasure. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Simon. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Uh, let's do this again sometime soon. Will do. And uh, I should uh, give some closing remarks here. Um, The podcast is produced by Nicole Bedford, and we want to to thank her tremendously for her work on on this podcast. Uh, We also have uh, support with transcription and captioning uh, provided by Kika Mueller. So if you're not uh, aware of that, you're able to access a a full transcript of the uh, interviews through our website. Uh, And uh, that is at ecopoliticspodcast.ca. We also want to thank Adam Gibbard, who helps us with uh, fantastic artistic uh, designs and and digital support, all things digital. Uh, That's Adam's wheelhouse, so we thank him as well. Uh, The podcast is made available under a Creative Commons license 2.0 in Canada. And what that basically means is you're free to use it and share it and, and, uh, you know, use it in your classes. We just ask that you provide an appropriate attribution and and don't uh, use it for commercial purposes and don't mix it up. Uh, You know, don't don't remix or transform the material. Um, We finally want to thank our funding partners at the University of Ottawa and Carleton University and remind listeners to follow us on Twitter at ecopolitics p that's ecopolitics with a capital p and get in touch uh, either through social media or through our website so thank you very much Uh, see you all in our next episode and stay tuned